Thank you everyone for joining me. We're going to discuss some teaching strategies for engaging our students and how we can rethink our long lectures. And just a quick look at what's on the agenda for today. We're going to do a quick round of introductions and then I want to hear from you a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about some hurdles and obstacles that we can encounter when we're engaging with long lecture material. After that, um, once we kind of address what, what the barriers are, then we can look at things we can do to, to revamp the long lecture. I think I have eight different strategies for you today. Um, we're going to follow it up with just some other considerations, some factors that you're going to want to take into account when you decide how you want to structure your course and how you want to set up your lecture material. And of course, the final Q&A um, and the wrap up. But if you have questions along the way, comments, uh, let me know. I'd love to hear from you. So um, you can turn on your microphone or type in the chat. Um, and we'll just save that final session for the very end. All right, so if you wouldn't mind finding that little chat icon um, and letting me know your name, maybe what courses you teach, or if you're not a teacher, what your role is at NIU, and then what do you find most challenging about lectures? And again, you can use the chat or the microphone, I should have said, whichever you prefer. Thanks, Anna. So you teach Intro to Enviro Econ and Game Theory, Grad Math, Micro. And you find breaking up lectures difficult, particularly if you can't find that natural stopping point. Ah, OK. I may have some suggestions. Welcome, Jeff. You're teaching special education. Some of your classes meet OK, once a week and three hours can be a big challenge. Absolutely. I, I know about those classes. Welcome, Rachel. So you're teaching seed faculty, reading math methods course. Devices can pull student attention. Yes, yes. I'm guilty of this as well. And I apologize, I hope I pronounced this correct. Is it Farah? You're an assistant professor of sports management. Ooh. And you're trying to keep up participation and involvement, particularly this time of year. Is that because of the weather or COVID or all of the above? Welcome, Bill. Nice to hear from you. So Bill is teaching music and he finds keeping our students um, engaged consistently it can be an issue. Absolutely. Jayhi, you're teaching human resource management and you're wondering how to make something more fun um, instead of boring lecture slides. Interesting. Great. <laughs> yes, yeah, so these are all of our um, distractions right now. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're still in COVID and now the weather's getting nicer and we really want to go outside. It's all of the above. Absolutely. Okay, so this gives me a little bit of insight into some of the struggles that you're experiencing um, or concerns that you may have. Um, and the reason that I kind of asked for this right away is because I, I like to get the obstacles and the challenges, you know, right out there in the open. 
So I think now's the time where we can dive into that. If we acknowledge what these obstacles are, um, then we can go about addressing them. So I do wanna talk about, you know, why are we doing this? Like, why are we reimagining our lecture? Well, um, as many of you mentioned, there are some potential barriers that come with long lectures. So during the pandemic, we heard a lot about Zoom fatigue, um, but this can happen even in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom. So you can still experience this draining fatigue and it's echoed by our students. So they kind of feel this exhaustion after a long lecture. And rather than feeling motivated or incentivized to dive into their coursework, they may feel like they actually need to take a step back and, and take a break from their coursework. So it can actually become a missed opportunity. We also have to contend with distractions. And I know I saw something about that in the text chat. You know, in an online um, environment, this can be even more magnified. Um, there could be distractions such as, you know, household background noises or even the temptation to multitask, right? If you're online, you might have another tab open, another browser open. You're, you're trying to do more than one thing at once. Um, students are experiencing the same thing. But regardless, in any setting, the human mind does begin to wander. And so we see this when speakers begin to ramble and lose their train of thought. And we can also see it when students begin to zone out and miss some of that pertinent information that's being discussed in our courses. And then the third one that I put up here is kind of this, feel this feeling of isolation uh, when we're working with long lectures. I heard one instructor at NIU say that when they were recording lecture material, um, it kind of made her feel like she was a paid actor. There was no interaction with her students. Um, and it's easy to imagine that students are also left feeling you know, isolated and disconnected. So if we know that these are some of the potential barriers that come with our long lecture, then you know we've arrived at the stage where we can revise our approach to lectures. And in doing so, we want to think about our best teaching practices. The goal here is not to eliminate lectures. Um, they do serve a valuable function and we want to impart that new knowledge to our students. But instead, we're going to look at how we can make these lectures more engaging so students are more likely to retain that knowledge. Historically, in a lecture setting, students were expected to absorb all of this new content. So you can kind of see that sponge image that I have up on the screen. Uh, typically, teachers took on a very strong leadership role and students followed along. But now, increasingly, we're seeing there's more of an emphasis on this self-directed student learning. So teachers take on more of a facilitator role. And in doing so, students are encouraged to test and apply their skills. So it's in this theme of active learning that we can think about ways to reimagine the lecture scenario. Um, and one of the most effective ways that we can do this is to um, revisit our lecture session and align it with your course learning goals or your stated course objectives. If you'll recall, a strong learning objective typically uses an action verb and it asks students to complete some type of observable behavior. So for instance, um, you can just kind of try to fill in the blank. By the end of this course, students will, and you put in your action verb, um, my background is in teaching English, so I might have said by the end of this course, students will write a research essay, right? They're doing something that I can physically observe. Um, but by the end of a lecture session, you might consider answering the same question, but on a smaller scale. So if we say by the end of this lecture, students will understand we know that we need to kind of pause. Um, I, I see this uh, happen a lot. We can't physically climb into our students' heads and, and check out their cognitive you know, abilities. So instead of saying students will understand, it's kind of a passive word. Uh, we know we need to implement some type of an activity that measures that level of understanding. Uh, so we're going to try to make sure that we're doing something interactive um, with our lecture material. So that's kind of the first step in reimagining our lectures. All right. 
I think we're now at the stage where we can talk about revamping the lecture. And so as promised, I have, I think it's eight different strategies for you. So we're gonna start with the student-led lecture. A student-led lecture requires a degree of responsibility and it also changes the flow of the course. When you have different presenters, you're going to have different styles. And so automatically the course becomes more dynamic with each new person who takes the lead in a discussion. Having student-led lectures also gives you a break. You're not always on the spot. We wanna to try to eliminate that feeling of you're being paid as an actor, right? We don't, we don't want that scenario anymore. Um, so when you introduce student-led lectures, um, consider also incentivizing your students. Uh, let them know that their section will appear later on in the course. So whatever topic that they're covering is going to appear on a test or an assessment, or it's going to be crucial to being able to complete the following homework assignment. Uh, but the lesson that they are delivering is going to directly relate to future coursework. With undergrads, they may have never seen this model um, kind of fully developed. So you may want to incrementally lead them into the student-led lectures. You might want to start with giving them just a, a small section of the lecture, um, a particular topic versus grad students, they may have seen this modeled uh, previously, and so now you can up the level of responsibility. You can ask them to teach an entire unit, um, and whether that's a chapter or again, a specific research topic, but you can give them a, a bigger piece of that lecture that they can take over. When you ask your students to lead the lecture, also th consider asking them for different styles of presentations. Um, do you want them to do something other than a PowerPoint? Are they going to be doing this as individuals or is this going to be a group activity? Um, also ask them once they deliver the lecture, are they required to facilitate some type of follow-up activity? And if so, what expectations do you have for them as lecture leaders? All right, and the next one is the flipped classroom model. And I know it's been growing a lot in popularity, so it might be something that you are familiar with. It's this idea that the students are going to spend most of their time testing their knowledge and skills, practicing and doing various activities to enhance their learning but the instructor may do some lecturing. It's just on a smaller scale. So as you can see kind of in the model here, we've, we've kind of flipped the ratio. So a great way to start facilitating this type of environment is actually to begin by changing the structure of your lecture. So one way that you can do this is to start your class with an activity. Um, and again, this could be a group activity, it could be uh, a solo activity, students could be doing it individually, but give your students a problem that they actually have to solve. Um, don't give them any of that new lecture content, you're going to withhold that, and then see what they do. This is a period where you get to observe. Um, can they even solve the problem? If they do, how is their progress? Is it slow, is it clunky? Could they have done something more efficiently? After you've put them through this activity of problem solving, switch to the lecture material. Provide them with some new insight that directly relates to that problem solving activity that they just completed. And then the third stage here is you're going to want to return to the student reflection period. And you're going to ask them to finish the statement. If I knew at the start of the class what I know now, I would have done what? What would they have done differently? Um, this is allowing them to take into consideration their behavior, but how their newly acquired knowledge also impacts their behavior. A second option for a flipped classroom environment or a flipped classroom uh, lecture environment is to ask your students to conduct and share some of their own research. Uh, typically, when we think of lecturing for our students, we're the ones who are in charge of coming up with the content. But this is an opportunity where you can bring your students into the fold. 
So once you set the groundwork for a specific topic, ask your students to locate some current media that directly relates to the concept being discussed. Uh, and you can ask them to get creative. Are they looking at news articles, blogs, scholarly journal articles, podcasts, YouTube videos? Um, it's a great way to introduce other types of media as well, uh, which will also help with their um, attention span. So as part of the lecture follow-up, ask them to link their resources. You could do this in a Blackboard discussion board um, so that everybody has quick access to these resources. Um, you can ask your students to provide a quick summary or to discuss their own opinion of the resource that they found. Um, and then after they've done their first initial post, you can ask them to do follow-ups and to remark on their peers' findings. This idea of reversing the order kind of goes hand in hand with the flipped classroom experience. Um, so I, I want to encourage you to think about your lecture content um, in regards to any way that your students can access your, your coursework, um, which also includes with Blackboard. So we know that at NIU, over 95% of our faculty request a Blackboard course each time they, they teach a course. And this was true even before the start of the pandemic. So we know that there's a heavy reliance on our LMS system. So when we look at our courses, you want to look at the structure. How are your students interacting with the content? Um, we know that our students are probably logging into Blackboard for things like quizzes, activities, um, homework, you know, as well as your lecture material. So your lecture material could be a recorded lecture, or it could even just be where you've posted your PowerPoint notes. And so one concern that we hear from faculty is that they don't know if their students are listening to those recordings or reviewing the PowerPoint slides. And if you find yourself in this position and you're worrying about whether or not your students are actually engaging with the content, it's an opportunity for you to consider changing the dynamic of how students can approach their Blackboard content. One, um, popular method of organization that we see is dividing your course into weekly modules. If you have 16 weeks, you have 16 modules. Um, and as you go into the, your week, a lot of times you'll see the lecture content posted at the top, right? The first thing that we ask them to do is to review the new material. But sometimes students might be bypassing it. So ask yourself, what would happen if you switched up the order? What if we had your students doing an activity first. Next, what if you kind of mandated that order that now that they've completed an activity, they need to go to the lecture content. And again, um, like we said, it kind of goes hand in hand with that flipped classroom environment. After they've done an activity, then they had to watch the recording or look at the PowerPoint notes, then they had to complete the reflection. And the way that you can do this is you can use your Blackboard technology. Uh, there are rules that you can use. So if you're in a Blackboard original course, you can use your adaptive release rules. Um, in Blackboard Ultra, it's called conditional availability. But these rules are what you put in place that structure how and when your students can access the material. So before you can go on to the reflection, you need to have listened to the recording type of a thing. So again, if we change the structure, if we completely rearranged our course and then we mandated through the use of our Blackboard tools that they go through a sequence of steps, would this make our lecture content more engaging? So I'll pause just before I, I move on to our, our next one. Did that at all make sense about the, the Blackboard tools that you have at your disposal or any other questions? All right, all looks quiet in the chat so I can move on. Another option here is that we can bring in a mystery guest. Again, um, we want to try to 
increase the number of voices that are heard throughout our course. Um, so I have thrown onto the slide here some different options of people that you can bring into your course. Um, part of creating that engaging environment is to make sure that we have variety. All right. Not everybody that need that you can invite into your course um, has to be a field expert either. So um, if you can find an author, um, you know, maybe it's the author of an article uh, that you actually introduced in the course, that would be wonderful. Um, but if not, you can still do this on a smaller scale. So you can think about role playing options. And one example of this is a science instructor needed to discuss, I think it was chemical reactions. And so they could have outlined what would happen when you combined these different compounds in a traditional lecture. Um, but instead of just doing a regular lecture on these you know, chemical reactions, they brought in some friends to act out the scene. As the actors bumped into each other, students were presented, I think, with three different options. What chemical could they add next? And again, the actor would act out the, the role of that particular chemical compound. Um, and so they would set off a series of events on stage that the students could observe. They could see these people actually bouncing off of each other. Another example uh, that comes to mind is um, actually someone brought in a medical expert and they decided they wanted to, this was again, the, the medical expert, this was the guest speaker, um, but they decided that they wanted to test their students' knowledge of infectious diseases. Um, so students wore a sign on their back with the names of their infectious disease. And other students were called upon one at a time. Um, and the person that was called on had to either provide a symptom, a treatment, or a long-term effect of the disease. And the student with the card uh, then had to guess their disease. So um, it was a, a very, you know, kind of strategic way to, to get together, to, to act out scenes, to bring in new voices. Um, and it eliminated this need for the instructor to have to lead the discussion every single class period. All right, so I, I do wanna to talk to you a little bit about micro lectures. Um, but again, I, I do want to ask you a question here. So if you wouldn't mind, you can again use your microphone or type in the chat. Um, but in your opinion, what is the ideal length of time for a recorded class lecture? Ten minutes. That's you've recently switched to that. Twenty minutes, fifteen minutes. Anna says no clue. That's fair enough. Anna, something that you can pause. Excellent. Okay. So I have one more question for you. In your opinion, what is the ideal length of time? for an in-class lecture. <laughs> Rachel, oh, you see what I did? Uh-oh. <laughs> Somebody said 10 minutes, someone said 15 minutes, okay. And it says no, because it's a waste to show up for 15 minutes, 75 minutes with breaks. Okay, great. Bill says it depends on the material. No universal rule, it, it's subjective to each lesson. Okay, great. What I do sense here though is, is actually some consensus um, from your answers. So when we discuss micro lectures, it's 
not this idea that we're going to try to cram a bunch of material into the span of a few minutes, um, because inevitably you'll never get it all in. Um, but instead, it's this idea that you are dividing up your lecture into multiple segments. And even Anna's suggestion, well, 75 minutes could be a great lecture, um, but we're going to take breaks. So it's still that same idea that there's going to be a pause, there's going to be a break. Um, and so the, one of the ways that you can go about doing this, because there are different types of lecture formats, so you could do a recorded lecture or it could be in a face-to-face -face classroom, but you're going to want to make a either a timeline or an outline of what you want to discuss. Um, this also helps eliminate some of the areas where you're going to stumble or ramble. Um, and then you're going to mark the areas where you're going to either stop the recording or you're going to switch gears in your course. Giving your students a break is a wonderful idea. Or another idea is if we're going to take a break anyway, let's make sure that we dive into some type of an activity. So if it's an in-class lecture, um, be sh sure to ask your class, you know, some sort of a question, usually not a yes or no question, um, maybe a problem solving activity, maybe a group work. Um, doesn't have to be a graded assessment. I do want to stress this. Um, we're not trying to increase your grading workload by any means. We're, we're just going to kind of space out our lecture material. And how can we do that? Well, one of the ways that we can do this is we can introduce an interactive video quiz. Um, so I, I did promise to let you know about some different tools and technologies uh, that you can use as we look at ways to break up our lecture. So we do have and I use video platform Kaltura, which will take any recording and turn it into an interactive video quiz. Uh, this is actually an example that you're looking at on the screen of the uh, starting slide that students would see. And you can customize the message. So I can even tell my students, this video is 15 minutes long. Please watch it in one sitting. All questions must be answered, and then the quiz will be submitted at the end. So this idea of the interactive video quiz uh, is that the students are going to start the video they will be prompted to pause and answer a question. Once they've submitted their answer, the recording picks up where they left off and it resumes playing until the next question appears. So um, again, I do want to stress it's an interactive video quiz. The idea is that you're going to pepper in questions as they're watching your recording, as opposed to just uh, laying out a whole bunch of quiz questions at the very end of the quiz. So this is something that you can do as a graded or ungraded exercise. So if this is something that interests you, I will be sending out um, some follow-up information after this workshop and I can let you know more about how to build the video quiz. One of the things you'll notice here is that I put this video is 15 minutes. Um, there's still um, some debate as to what is the ideal length of time for a lecture. Uh, so I, I was curious just to see what you put in the chat. There's not a, a necessarily right or wrong answer with it. Um, statistically speaking, we do know that really long lectures um, tend to lose their audience members along the way. So again, it is good to put in these breaks or these pauses. And with a recorded video, we would typically tell you to mark it at 15 minutes um, or under. And again, that isn't to say, you know, if you have 75 minutes of content, that you're going to try to cram all of that into 15 minutes. It just means that you're going to have multiple recordings available so that people are more likely to, to budget their time. They'll sit down for 15 minutes, and then after that, they'll pause, they'll, they'll go take care of whatever distraction uh, is calling their attention, and then they'll come back for the next video segment. Um, students we've discovered are more likely to watch smaller clusters of videos than to remember to pause a video um, that's longer in length. So we do know that our, our students, if they have a really long recording, um, they'll probably just let it run, but then they'll, they could even just leave the room 
Um, so again, when we're trying to look at our students' engagement with our, our lecture content, we try to break it up into pieces for them. The next idea that I have for you is um, kind of a fun one. And when we look at our lectures, a lot of times we encourage our students to take notes, um, but there is an opportunity here for students to do more with it. So as instructors, we do want to boost their kinesthetic, their auditory, and their visual learning skills. If they can flick, you know, kind of back and forth between the different uh, modalities, the different styles of learning, then they're more likely to succeed in their academics. So the next time, if you're wondering if your students understand that new material that you've presented, uh, you can ask your students to create either a concept map or a flow chart to check their knowledge. And I have two different options for you on how you can implement this strategy. So the first one is that you lecture on a new idea, a system, or a sequence, but then you're going to follow it up with an assignment that asks students to map out what they envision that concept to look like. And this works particularly well for either abstract concepts or theoretical frameworks, um, something where students can't look up a pre-existing model in a Google search. Um, basically, we're trying to, to bring in some of their creativity. You don't want your students to all have the exact same looking uh, flowchart or concept map. Your second option is, again, you can lecture about an idea, a system, or a sequence and you can introduce a sample scenario. So you're going to ask your students to map out a scene based on that new information that you just lectured on. So an example that I have for you that I, I've used again in my own teaching is um, I lectured on the literary concept of the anti-epiphany moment. And this is when characters in a novel may face a moment of realization and instead they choose not to change their behavior, uh, which results in a series of consequences. So I've asked students to then read a short story involving a number of characters. So they can choose who, who they wanna work with, um, and, but they have to map out that character's plot line uh, that they felt exemplified the anti-epiphany trajectory. So I do also want to send out a follow-up link for you. Um, I have found that there are actually these uh, great tutorials that are already pre-existing. They're made for students, uh, quick video demonstrations that teach students how to use either Google Docs or a Microsoft Word document um, to create their own custom flowchart or concept map. So it's a great exercise that you can introduce in class. Um, you can put in the link and ask your students to watch, you know, this tutorial video on how to create um, a concept map and that can be part of their homework um, so that they can then in future instances in your course or maybe elsewhere um, can use the, kind of the self-directed exercise that allows them to, to kind of build a new skill. So again, we're going to take our lecture material and we're going to ask our students to apply it. All right, so we're, we're getting closer towards the end here. We're doing really well on time. We also have what we consider to be the muddiest point. So hopefully this image kind of makes you smile a little bit. The muddiest point is where we give students an opportunity to voice concerns over areas of confusion. So once you have presented this new material, you've delivered your lecture, uh, you can then require students to submit a question about something that they don't understand or something that they want to know more about. Uh, to get full honesty from your students, it's a great idea to introduce this maybe as an anonymous exercise. Maybe they'll feel you know, less shy or less bashful um, about asking for clarification. So if you're in a face-to-face -face class, you could consider asking students to fill out a slip of paper and dropping it into a bowl uh, before the course concludes. If you're teaching online, you could ask students either to fill out an anonymous survey, or if you're a Blackboard Ultra user, you could ask students um, to fill out an assignment, um, but you would just enable anonymous grading. So you could view all of the student submissions without knowing who it came from. 
The follow-up part to the muddiest point, though, is so once they've submitted a question and they said, you know, I, I need more clarification, I don't understand this or that, um, then you want to actually speak to those to those questions. And so then it's time to decide how you want to address that. So you could, of course, um, answer their questions, maybe even in the following course, you know, you can check to see if there's a theme, maybe there's a, a reoccurring question that came in from your students. Or you could divide your students up into groups and you can ask each group to collectively answer one of the muddiest point questions. Um, so again, it's letting them become self-directed learners. If they don't know the answer, that can be a great opportunity for them to investigate and do some research and see if they can come up with it. I apologize if you can hear the honking. I'm on campus and the geese are right outside my window. So again, uh, with the muddiest point, um, the two main questions are what is unclear to you? Um, you know, it's just try to create this low stakes environment where they actually are, are willing to, to voice the, their confusion. And the other part is what do you want to know more about? They, maybe they've started to grasp a concept, but they need some more information. Um, again, this is a, a great place for them to, to get involved and to ask you those questions. All right, so we're, we're getting down to our, our final stretch. So there are just some other considerations that we need to look at with our, our lectures. Um, so as you go about, you know, kind of reimagining your, your lecture content, we're gonna have to ask some, some hard questions. And most of these questions um, that I, I think I wanna put on your plate are things that don't really have a right or a wrong answer, but your decision is going to impact your overall course structure. So when we start thinking about our lectures, um, we're going to need to take into factors things um, that maybe even aren't in our control. For instance, um, how do you plan to handle lecture engagement for large roster classes? Um, have you factored in some ungraded activities that can help enhance your, your students' learning um, while also not increasing your grading workload, right? We're trying to, to boost this engagement, um, but maybe not change the entire grading structure. We also want to look at how and when are we going to be doing these lectures. So are you planning on lecturing during scheduled class time, or is it something that they can watch in a recorded format through a Blackboard on their own time? Do you record your lectures? And if you have recorded lectures in the past, are you willing to consider experimenting with it to see, you know, can I, can I make them smaller? Can I, can I do these condensed micro lectures? Again, uh, micro lectures is still a subjective term. I didn't want to give you um, a, a hard and fast rule for how long your recordings would be. I would say, you know, if you're looking for at least a ballpark range for a recorded lecture, 15 minutes and under is a, is a good, Good neutral uh, starting point. Um, and if you have never recorded your lecture, would you be willing to try it to see if that frees up that valuable in-class time where you can actually work on activities? And finally, my last question is, you know, if you have lecture materials um, and your students do not appear to be listening either to the recorded session or maybe they're in your class, but it's like they're not retaining the information, um, have you considered revising your lectures? Uh, is this an opportunity for you to edit them, to crop them? When we format our, our lectures, we always want to think about how does this um, impact our, our students' course progress? And is it relevant and essential to their other activities? So if you have all of this lecture content, which may be wonderful and glorious, but they don't actually need it to complete any of their other activities, do we need that lecture content? Uh, 
So do you have crucial information that can be kind of deployed systematically through the use of those either adaptive release or conditional availability rules? Um, but think about what information do they need and when are they going to get it? Um, and so once you've answered these questions, you'll have probably a better grasp on how you want to structure a lecture that boosts engagements and help students retain that information. We ultimately want our students to look at lecture material as something that's interactive. All right, so I know we did really well on time today, um, which is good. I always feel so guilty when I get you right before lunch. I know you must be counting the minutes. Um, I think we can probably move on then to Q&A. Any? questions, concerns, or suggestions? Well, I suppose as a final question for you, um, when you structure a lecture, have any of you ever actually charted your lecture? Do you, do you come up with an outline before you? Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I've done it in the past. I've I've learned it from an, a fellow faculty member where he kind of he did what you suggested earlier, like map out the time of what you're going to talk about. Um, and I've done that before. Uh, I found it pretty helpful. Uh, and once I got into the flow of things, I kind of stopped doing it. <laughs> it. Right. Part of the problem was that it became kind of a it just came became one more thing that I had to. It became a distraction for me almost is that not only was I teaching, but I have to refer to my schedule and then jump back and forth. And, you know, sometimes my schedule would have five or six things on it and just it got overwhelming sometimes. Sure, sure. Yeah, it, it's basically storyboarding. So, yep, it's this idea of not even just that I have bullet points I'm going to talk about, but it, it was actually like you kind of took a, a look at the timeline. And you're like, well, I, I think I need 10 minutes on, on this particular topic. But the other one only requires three. So, yeah, it, it, it can be a little bit um, daunting when you do that sometimes. You do feel that you've, you've taken on additional work. Uh, did you ever find out if did it cut down on your lecture time or did it increase it or? Any noticeable difference? Um, no. I, well, my goal at the time wasn't to cut down on my lectures, um, so it didn't. But I'm kind of getting to the point where I think I'm. This semester, I've been actually going through all my power. I, mean, I, I go through my powerpoints every semester. This semester, I purposely went through some, and tried to exercise some of the unnecessary slides, um, and I was a little bit successful, not entirely successful. Sure. Yeah, I think sometimes then when we rethink our lectures, it's not even about shorter or longer. It's just focused and purposeful with our intent. Great. Thank you. Yeah, my, kind of my biggest challenge right now is just how do I find the time to make so many? <laughs> all these revisions I want to make to all my classes, it's, it's pretty overwhelming. So I'm, I've been take, making baby steps. I don't know if anyone has well, any recommendations for ways to do it. If you can ever find a, a place to repurpose some of your existing content, um, you know, in more than one course and more than one section, um, I definitely recommend trying to, especially if you're recording something, um, try not to put date and time stamps on any of your, your videos so that you can repurpose it over the course of, you know, more than one semester. Anyone else? The interactive video quiz sounds great to me. You want to try to do it? I, I can teach you that workshop. Um, I will send you some follow-up information. Um, that's a tool that I've worked with um, extensively. So it, it is really nice um, knowing that you've put your, your recorded lecture out there, um, and now you get to see whether or not um, people understand it. Anna likes them. She says she uses them a lot. Wonderful. Yes, and it can be graded. It can be ungraded. Um, but again, it, it is kind of giving some of this ownership back to our students. Like, yes, I will give you all of this valuable information, but I do need you to do something with it. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to hang around and I'm going to stop the recording. And if you have any other questions, please let me know.